the Holy Gospel according to John, the second chapter. Glory, Glory to you, Lord. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken, the gospel of our Lord. About Maybe Bennington can pick something out of our prayer bowl today. Bennington, do you want to pick something out of our bowl? Do you want to pick something out for us to talk about? Oh, what did you find, Bennington? A ball. It's a ball, right? Can I see the ball too? Let's all look at this little ball here. This is what kind of ball? Do you know? Well, what color is it? It's white, and can you see anything on it? Red. You see that's got a little red line? Red, red. A red line, yeah. When you play balls, can you play ball inside the house? Can you throw balls inside the house? Yeah, you can. You're absolutely right. I asked if you can, and you can. But what happens if you throw balls inside the house? What will happen if the ball hits something that's fragile? It'll break, right? Or what happens if you take a ball like this inside and you, you throw it in there, people around, what if it hits somebody by accident? What will happen to them? They'll get hurt, right? So where's a good place to play with balls? Outside. Outside, yeah. Jesus, in the story we heard today, he found people who weren't doing what they should be doing where they were. It was like he found people playing with balls inside a house. And he said, you can't throw balls inside the house because you might break things and you might hurt people. The house is supposed to be safe for people to live in, right? And Jesus said, especially God's house, right? This is God's house. Everyone needs to be safe here, right? People are safe to come and to sing songs to God and talk to God with prayers and shake hands and say, peace be with you, right? Yeah. yeah. So when we look at this little ball inside of our prayer bowl, it's a reminder. Bennington, can you put it back in the prayer bowl? Thank you. That we, we come to God's house and we make sure everybody knows this house is filled with love and safety for all God's children, right? Yeah. I thank you so much for coming up and looking at that ball with me. And we'll see what comes out of our prayer bowl in new weeks. Okay. Yeah, we'll have to talk about that one maybe next week. But can we say a prayer? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for this house of God, for love, for safety, for prayers, and friends to share it with. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for coming up today. Bennington, thank you. Galilee, Kaylin, thank you. Grace, mercy, and peace to you all. From God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. 
There is so much tucked away in the gospel to shape our lives, especially when we hear of Jesus coming to the temple, overturning the money changers, setting free the sacrifices, cleansing the house of God. The people come out. There's dialogue and debate. There's more than we can fit into a sermon. It's perhaps enough for us to know in the cleansing of the temple Don't throw balls inside the house where they break things and hurt people, but keep the house of God safe and open for all people to come and raise their praise, their prayers, and their sacrifices. That's what it means to take care of the house of God. That's what it means for priests to be in service at the temple of the Holy One, where the name of Almighty God who drew us out of a land of slavery, out of the house of Egypt, who set us on a promised and free inheritance. That's the service we give to a God who comes to dwell among us. And that's where Jesus unfolds the gospel in our lives. When the Lord came and cleansed the temple and people came questioning by what authority he did this, what sign did he have to show that he had the right to interrupt their lives, what they were really showing was the truth of humanity. Because the priests of that temple 2,000 years ago are no different from the priesthood of all believers today. It is our job to care for the worship of Almighty God. It is our job to ensure that people can bring their sacrifices, live out their lives, find grace and forgiveness. It is our job as priests in the church of Christ as it has always been for the priests of God's people to ensure that the door is open and our prayers rise to heaven like incense. But what Jesus found was people putting commerce and greed, gluttony, in front of the work of prayer. Jesus says, my Father's house is to be a house of prayer for all people, And you have made it a den of thieves. It's ironic that the leaders of the temple would question Jesus. They had dedicated themselves to the temple service. They had dedicated themselves to the liturgy, to the hymns and the psalms of the people. They had dedicated themselves to lighting the candles in the appropriate way and to raising up incantations to God. But when the Word made flesh stood in front of them, when God, who in the beginning was with God and was God and came to dwell among us, full of grace and truth, when God stood in front of the temple in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, the priests could not recognize him. Every pilgrim, every worshiper who came to adore the God of Israel was blind to the fact that the very God of Israel stood before them in the presence of Jesus Christ. They should have been in his service. They should have cared for him. They should have welcomed him. They should have given him the riches of their lives. But instead they asked him what right he, the Messiah, had to interrupt the temple made with human hands. We find ourselves in exactly the same place within this priesthood of all believers. We become so protective of the idea we have of who God is. We want to keep God in these little boxes that we call temples. 
so much so that when God looks us eye to eye, we don't recognize the living one because we're so hung up on the idols we've constructed. The priests, the Jewish leaders from the temple who come to Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, they'll dog him for the next three years that he tries to proclaim good news. They'll chase him. They'll try to catch him in traps and lies. And finally the day will come when the very priests who should offer Jesus their lives in service instead will put money on his head. They'll arrest him in the dead of night. They'll drag him into court. They will lie and bear false witness not only against their neighbor, but against their very creator. They will slap him and spit on him, drive thorns into his body. They will strip him and whip him. They will lead him before the world to be mocked. Irony of ironies, the priests of God murdering God because God's truth was so different than their human minds could comprehend. I confess to that same God Almighty before the whole company of heaven and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have done the same. By my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault, I have tried to defend an idea of a God that I would like to keep in a box rather than walking as a disciple of the living God who calls us to overturn the money tables, to set free the sacrifice of animals, and instead raise up a sacrifice of mercy and praise and thanksgiving. That's my confession. And a confession I share with all the other priests of the Holy One, Jesus comes to our lives seeking something other than our gold and our blood. He wants us to walk with him in ministry where those who walk the street at night are called into the table and fed as sisters and brothers. He wants us to walk with him where people whose lives are torn apart with illness and disease and demons are set free to stand up and live. Jesus begs us into a life of discipleship where we stand in the face of death and sing at the grave that our God is stronger than the hate, the judgment, the parochialism, the small boxy temples of our beings. Jesus says, I am the temple where you meet the God who counts. I am the temple where you meet the God who is love and tear me down, crucify me, stick me in a small stone box in a cemetery. Three days time, I'll be back. I'll be cleansing again. I'll be stepping behind the locked doors where the priesthood of all believers cowers in fear. And Jesus Christ promises, I will be the one who breathes on you the spirit of holiness that you can be set on your own feet for peace. Jesus comes to us as he came to that temple made of stones, and he replaces it with a firm foundation in his life that he pledges to make the life we share with one another and with him and through him with God who gives us life and movement and being. And cleansed by that Christ, we then go out of this house of God 
to meet God in the temple where the Holy Spirit dwells in our neighbors and those for whom the doors are now open, that we might hear the words spoken to and through us, fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, I am your God. I will still give you aid. I will strengthen you. I will cleanse you. And I will cause you to stand with your sisters and brothers upheld in God's omnipotent hand. Amen.